Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. Listen, I, I do love this congregation, and I probably cut up a little bit more than I should. But just let you know I'm having fun. Steve said, hey, amen. I ain't here. <laughs> and, uh, but it just lets you know, like I say, I, I say it often, but I do mean it. We, I love you. <laughs> Suzanne loves you. We, we love you. And we appreciate you and appreciate uh, the opportunity to serve the Lord in this congregation. Uh, it does mean much to us. And so we're thankful for it. And want you to, do want you to know that, that you are valued to us. So what should we pray for? That's the question that I want us to look at tonight. Very simple, very straightforward, but yet at the same time, too, it's one of those reminders. You know, when you stop and think about it, and you, I know you don't think about this congregation from the vantage point of a preacher. But I look around and I see you all and you've been students of the Bible for years. And so you sit down and you say, okay, what do I need to preach? And you say, okay, well, these topics kind of need to be said. And then you say, okay, what have these folks not heard before? And then you just leave that page blank <laughs> because you've heard it before and you've studied it before. But, if you approach the Bible from the standpoint of remembering Paul, or excuse me, Peter, remember in 2 Peter 3, said this, this second epistle I write unto you, beloved, to remind you. So that's what preaching really is. It's reminding you. So tonight, that's what we're doing. We're reminding you of things that you already know. There was a little child one time that knelt down beside his bed and he prayed. He said, he said God, he said, please don't die. He said, if you die, we're all sunk, so please don't die. Well, that little child in his innocence truly said a mouthful. When the Bible talks about prayer, it often talks about and uses a word that's interesting. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, you find this word. You find it in a couple of other passages. You find it in Ephesians 6. You find it uh, in, in these passages, and it's the word supplication. And when you look at, at the word supplication, you say, what does, what does it mean? What does it mean, praying always with all prayer and supplication? What does, what does that mean? Well, the word supplication just simply means a request. But it's a request made from a certain position. It's not just a request. But it's a request made from a position of asking one who is higher and greater and mightier than us. And so when we go to God in prayer, we are requesting, we are making supplication, we are requesting from him certain things. Now, it is true we can spend a whole time in prayer just of thanksgiving. There, I've done it before, you know, where, where all you're doing is you're just thanking God for blessing after blessing after blessing. But by and large, the nature of prayer is request. I'm requesting. What, are, what do I request? Well, I'm praying for something. And so we ask then the question, what do we pray for? Well, we pray for people, don't we? Paul talked about the idea of people and prayer, and, and, and we get that in First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. We're to pray always with all prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. But we're to pray. What do we pray for? What well, we pray for people? We pray for those that are in charge, right? We pray for those that are in charge of the, of the land, for the powers that be, First Timothy 2. We pray for the elders, the church. Why? Because those the powers to be. We pray for people, though, according to James chapter 5, that are sick. If any sick among you, let him pray. We pray for the lost in Romans chapter 10. Paul reminds us that he's, he talks about those that had a zeal for God, not according to knowledge, but he says, my prayer to God for Israel is that you might be saved. 
We pray for for those that are going through difficult times, those that are going through hard times, those that are going through sad times, those that are, that are having problems in their home and in their family, those that are having marital problems. I know of, of individuals that, that are having marital problems, and probably you do too. I know of a preacher that's having marital problems. You know, that happens. So what do we do? We pray for those people. We pray for, for the missionaries. We pray for, for, by all means, the preacher. God needs them. We pray for people. Why? Because that's what the Bible tells us to do. Paul prayed for people. Paul uh, talks about in Philippians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1 that my prayer for you is... Matter of fact, if you go to Paul's epistles, it's interesting to find that in Paul's epistles, I did this not long ago, where Paul says, I'm praying for. Remember, he, he did it, as we said in Colossians chapter 1, that you might walk worthy of the Lord in all things, pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in knowledge. And he goes through this list, this litany list, if you will, of things with regards to the brethren there at Colossae. And so we need to pray for people whatever their situation is and whatever our relationship may be with them. But we pray for protection. Do you remember what Jesus prayed for? He told, or excuse me, what he he told his disciples to pray for in Matthew chapter 6. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus believed that, and Jesus taught that. Matter of fact, what did he tell in the Garden of Gethsemane? Those that he had left, Peter, James, and John, when he'd left them a little ways, and he'd gone on in, as it said, further into the garden. When he came back, they were asleep. What did he, what did he tell them? Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. You see, we pray for protection. Why? Because we know that Satan is alive and well and working. He'll stop at nothing. He doesn't care about anybody. He only really cares, if you will, about himself. And so he's not only working on you, but he's working on your brother and sister in Christ, and he's working on your neighbor, and he's working on the the friend that you have that lives down the road or across town or wherever they may live. And he's working on them. And we need God to protect us. God has promised that he would. God has said that he would. God has, remember, he's already fought the fight, Jude 6, that he cast down the angels of sand and cast them into, into excuse me, everlasting chains. God will protect us. God will, will watch over us. God will take care of us. You know, the psalmist, go back and read the Psalms sometimes in your for your study and for your enjoyment and see the number of times where the psalmist talks about the Lord God's the sun and the shield, the Lord's my shield. Psalm three, the Lord's my shield, the Lord God's my sun and shield. He, he's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, Psalms eighteen. On and on we could go. The Bible talks about the Lord being our protection. Remember in Psalm one twenty one, that Psalm that Probably we all know he talked about how that the Lord's our shade. And we get the understanding of shade. Lord, he talks about how the sun shall not smite you by day nor moon by night. And we think that's strange, but it's the idea of protection. The sun, the, we understand the effects of sun. As we look at Psalm 121, we look at that and we say, well, I understand that. But how about moon by night? That seems a little strange, but yet, have you ever heard of being moonstruck? In biblical times, they really believed in the idea of being moonstruck and the effect of moon upon individuals. And so when the psalmist says that he'll not allow the sun shall strike you by day nor moon by night, he's trying to explain to the reader the protection of God. So can we pray for that protection? Can we ask for that protection? The answer is yes. 
Will he give us that protection? Sure. And so we pray for people. We pray for protection. We pray for forgiveness. Go back to the model prayer of Matthew chapter 6. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. We pray for the forgiveness of our own sins. Why? Because we sin. And while we're able to come before the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, we're able to ask God for what we need. We need prayers, but we need forgiveness. Remember, John reminds us in 1 John 4, verse 8, that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. We talked a little bit about that this morning, the fact that we all sin, we all make mistakes, and that's all right. It's not, it's not what we want, it's just a matter of reality. It's not what we strive for, but it is just what happens. And so we need forgiveness. John reminds us in 1 John 1 where he talks about that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. But he goes on to say, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, forgives our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But now, preacher, what about this forgiveness? Can I just pray for forgiveness? Well, we know God's plan. We know that God has the plan, and, and we've put it together in sort of a simplistic form, haven't we? You know, you don't find it from the standpoint of the Bible that says, here it is, but, but we've put it together, and we've show, we can show examples of it, especially in the book of Acts, that God's plan of salvation is, of course, hearing the word of God and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God repenting or changing the direction of our life, confessing our faith that we what we believe, that that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and being baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. We understand we need that. We understand that we, we must do that, that this is what God expects, this is what God asks, and God has told us that he'll forgive us when that blood of Jesus Christ through our obedience from the standpoint of obeying the will of God and coming in contact with the blood of Christ, will forgive us of our sins. But whereas the story that I told some time ago about the man that went down into the baptistry to be baptized, he'd been studying as an individual for quite a while. He had come to the point in which he wanted to obey the gospel, and so he simply asked, and the individual said, oh, yes, and they went to the building that night, and the individual baptized this individual for the forgiveness of their sins. And when the individual came up out of the water, he turned to his teacher, and he says, now what? Now what? Well, it's a great question. Now what with regards to the Christian? What does the Christian do? Well, when he sins, he, he prays and ask, forgive us. But what about James chapter 5 and verse 16? Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. It's the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man that avails much or works much. How do we, how do we deal with that? Where does that fall? Well, think about what James says. Confess your faults one to another. Do I have to confess all of my faults to you all every week? No. I think it's the old rule of thumb that has been preached for many years. I still think that it's correct. As, as public as the sin is, is as public as the confession needs to be. You know, every once in a while, not here. This has not happened, at least to me here. But in congregations where I have served, at the end of a, of a sermon, somebody to come forward, needing prayers in church, prayers for strength, but also prayers for forgiveness. And somebody will walk out and say, well, I wonder what they did. I, you know, you know me, sometimes it's hard to put a lock on this mouth. And I, I'll say, do you not know? Well, no. Then it doesn't pertain to you. Oh, but if you do know, they've asked you to forgive them. And I would suggest you go home and pray for them. I want to include the caveat, I do not. You better pray for yourself, too. But I don't. 
we need to understand, though, that when we do sin, it's a private sin, that which only God knows, that the God that has promised to forgive us of our sins has said to ask, and I'll forgive you. Now, we have this other question that looms large, and that is the idea, well, do you know, does God only forgive me when I pray? In other words, when I ask him in prayer. So here's the thought. If I prayed for forgiveness this morning before I left the house, and by lunchtime I have done something which I shouldn't have done, but I don't pray to God for till the evening for forgiveness, and yet I die between lunchtime and that evening prayer, will God forgive me? What does 1 John 1, 7 say? If we walk in the light, sees in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. God is forgiving us. Does it mean then that I don't have to ask? No. Why? Because God's told us to ask for forgiveness. It's our acknowledgement of where we are and what we've done. And it's our petition of asking God for his grace, for his mercy. And so we pray for forgiveness to a God that understands and a God that, that is approached by our mediator, by our advocate, Jesus Christ, who goes as serving, in, if you will, in the function of the high priest in Hebrews chapter 4, and going before the very throne of God with our prayers, he takes them and he says, Father, I understand where these people have messed up because I was there and knew the temptation. Our Father promises to hear those prayers. He promises to forgive us of our sins. And so we pray for forgiveness, but we also pray for wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge, I think we know the difference, but let's let's kind of define terms here for just a second. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. I had a, a teacher at Freed Hardman University, Brother Hank McDaniels. I had to take theater appreciation, enjoyed it. It was not a good semester for Hank, but it was a, he was a good teacher and a good man. Hank uh, came in, and that semester his wife had passed away, right? over Christmas break, and so he came in a couple of weeks late. We'd had a, a fill-in for a couple of weeks. But as Hank was introducing himself to us, we all knew him, but as he was introducing himself to us, he says, that's Hank McDaniel, Ph.D. He really cared nothing about the Ph.D. He had it. He just simply said, that's piled high and deep. That's all it means. I wanted to say, I've also heard it means post hole digger, but I didn't. But it means piled high and deep. He was that way. He was very approachable, a very kind gentleman. People study. People spend time in books and, and study and have great knowledge. Yeah, I, you know, I've got two or three initials after my name. So what? But that's the That's the gathering of knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to take that knowledge and use it. If I understand that two plus two is something simple, two plus two is four, and I go out here and I need to understand that two of whatever I have and add two more is four. If I'm measuring something and I have two inches and I want to make it, I want to double the size, then I need to know that I've got two more inches and so I can look on my ruler and say, well, four, four is it. I understand the principle. I'm able to apply the principle, say, to measurement or, or to money or to objects, whatever it is. I'm able to take the principle, and that's really what it's about. Kids, kids unfortunately, don't understand school. School is not about the idea of wisdom. School is about the, the ability to, to pile high and deep that knowledge so that when you get out on your own, you can take that knowledge and you can apply it to life, thus wisdom. Discernment 
becomes the ability to choose between. We need all three, to be honest. Now, how do we go about getting them? You get knowledge through study. You get knowledge through spending time with this Bible. Remember the the times that the Bible talks about this idea of study. Isaiah 34, seek the law and read it. Give all diligence. The old King James says study. King Timothy 2, verse 15. New King James says give diligence. To what? Be approved in God. Spend time with it. But not just time reading it, but time then meditating upon it. Asking the questions that we've often talked about that, that you ought to ask. What do you want me to know? What do you want me to be? And what do you want me to do? Those are three questions that ought to always be asked when we read the Bible. Yeah, and it gets hard. You know, we just finished out here in the auditorium on Wednesday nights. We just finished 1 Samuel. Those three questions get hard to answer because they're just narratives. They're just historical, if you will, uh, happenings. And so it's very difficult. Yet at the same time, too, we take that, we take that knowledge we meditate upon it, Psalm 1, and in meditating upon it, then we, in asking those questions, we discern and we try to take those things and apply them. We understand the limitations of God that, that he has put on our life. In other words, he says, here's things I want you to do and here's things I don't want you to do. Lord willing, uh, I will sit down the next few days and, and or weeks and and figure out exactly what I do want to preach next year. But I know pretty much at the first of the year on Sunday morning, I want to talk about what uh, Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 1, Christian graces. I want to spend time with others. We're going to talk about, you know, what they are and how, how to use them, how, how they're to be in our life. Well, there's that application. There's that wisdom. James, you may recall, in James chapter 1, verse 5, says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally. God gives. Gives what? Wisdom. Now, I'll, now here's, the, here's the question most folks are going to ask. At least I ask when I look at that verse. God, how are you going to do it? The Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say, well, God's going, you know, when you go to sleep tonight and you've asked for wisdom, God's going to give you all of this and you're just going to all of a sudden have all the wisdom in the world. You're going to be like Solomon. Remember the promise of God in Second Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 10 was the wisdom that God was going to give him to lead Israel. The Bible doesn't tell us how. And to be honest, that shouldn't be our concern. It's our inquisitive nature, but it shouldn't be our concern. Our concern is to, to pretty much ask for the wisdom that he told us to ask for. And so when we get that wisdom, then we're able to take it and we're able to apply it to our life, to live our life. That when temptation comes, we understand that there's a way of escape. That when life comes, we're able to watch and stand fast in the faith and be strong like men, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. That we're to be the, the individual that God would have us to be, to live the life that God would have us to live. And so we need to ask for wisdom. Lord, let me take what I learned on Sunday and apply it to my life. Let me take what I learned on Monday and Tuesday in my own personal study and help me to apply it to my life. Give me the wisdom to be able to apply it to my life. I want to be what you want me to be. And so we ask for wisdom. And we ask for physical blessings. Those things that, that God would give us, those things that come our way that are truly just that, blessings. We understand spiritual blessings, don't we? Have you ever thought about something? I want you to think about something. I thought about this a lot this week. Now, I found this somewhere else, but it caused me to think. 
And that's a good thing. The statement that was basically made in something that I was studying said that God will grant spiritual blessings, that they are just natural, they come. But God gives no guarantee that every temporal blessing that you ask for, he'll grant. Oh, so that explains it, that when I prayed for something from a physical standpoint, when I prayed for for maybe somebody's health, or when I prayed for, for the fact that, you know, my bank account would go up $1,000, or that when I prayed for something, God said no. Because there's no guarantee. The spiritual blessings, say, of Romans chapter 5, where he talks about peace and, and, and forgiveness and th- justification and things of that nature. Will he give me those? Sure. Why? Because those are guaranteed. So, as Jesus prayed in Matthew, or excuse me, as Jesus taught in Matthew 6, give us this day our daily bread. We need that same that Jesus was teaching that same teaching we needed in our life to pray for, for the things that we daily need. Now, one of the questions that comes with such a statement is where we were reminded in James 4 where, where really we don't need to ask for things that we may heap them upon ourselves because remember those who ask amiss. They were asking, if you will, out of their own want, not need, but want. remember need and want are two different things. We may need something. We need food. We need a certain amount of clothing and shelter. But we may want a bigger house or a bigger car. That's a want. That may not. That is not a need. God has told us to ask for those things. So we have to ask, well, then, if we pray it, are we praying a selfish prayer? No, we're literally praying a submissive prayer. Because, you see, we're praying not for the consumption of more things, but we're just praying for what we need. And so we are are being submissive to God and saying, here, I'm going to take what you're giving me, I'm going to use it. Now, we, we live in a country where we have much, right? Probably too much. Our closets are full. Our pantries are full. Our storage cabinets are full. Underneath our beds are full. Our storage lockers are full. We have much. preacher i can still pray for my physical blessings yes why because jesus taught us to pray for our physical blessings and so as we pray for that food as we pray for those things that are physical of nature our clothing and our shelter we're reminded of the importance because what it ultimately does in praying for our physical blessings, here's what it does. It reminds us of where we got it from. Who's the giver of the gift? And in reminding us who who is the giver of the gift, it also reminds us of where I fit in with regards to all of that. And that I am the recipient, I am the receiver of that and not the giver. And while you've heard me talk about, I haven't talked about it lately, but we hear about it so much on TV today. You deserve that. No, you were blessed with that. That's the truth. We don't deserve it, but we were blessed with it. And God says, ask. And so what do you pray for? Well, pray for a lot of things. But we pray for this reason, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Little girl, little girl knelt down beside her bed one evening, and she was praying. 
Her grandmother, she was staying with her grandmother. Her grandmother was not in the room at the time, but she was coming to pray with the little girl and have a little story and tuck her into bed. And as the grandmother got to the door, here's what she heard. A, B, C, D, E. And she just stood there. The grandmother did till the child finished, till she got all the way to Z. And then the little girl got up. She started getting into bed, getting ready for Grandma to come and have the story and maybe say a prayer with Grandma and, and go to sleep. And Grandmother said, uh, you know, pray in the alphabet. She said, uh-huh. Well, what were you doing that for? And she said, well, Grandma, I'm a, I'm a little kid, and I don't know everything I should pray for. But I just thought I'd give all the letters to God, and he could arrange them the way that I needed them. And he could give me what I needed. Ah, sometimes out of the mouth of babes comes great wisdom. As we pray, we pray to a God that knows what we need. But nevertheless, here's what he said. Talk to me. Pray to me. Ask. And so, will you bow for a word of prayer? Our most kind and loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for this day for the fact that you have given it to us, that you've blessed us with health and strength, that we're able to come out and, and be a part of a worship service and enjoy the fellowship one with another and be strengthened by the presence of one another. We're thankful for the love of this congregation. We're thankful, first of all, for the history of this congregation, for where it has come through the years of faithful service to you, and we're thankful for those that make up uh, this congregation now. And we ask that you bless each one of us. We realize that at times that we're weak creatures and we sin in your sight and we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you be with each member. That you bless them. So many, yea, all of us are struggling with something. We're going through difficult times. We're dealing with issues in life or work or enjoyment and we ask that you give us the wisdom that we will know how to control our mouth and our morals that we will live for you and with you that we will be the individuals that you would have us to be we're thankful for you sending your son we're thankful for the fact that he came to this world and that he gave up his own will to follow your will and to die on a cross for us. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins, for we realize that we are weak creatures, and at times we stray. We ask for that forgiveness, but we also ask for the strength to continue to move forward and to live the life that you would have us to live. We ask that you be with each of us, that you bless us. We're so thankful for all the things that we have, for we truly can say that we're all blessed. We all came here with nice clothes this evening, good health. We came from homes that were, were nice, comfortable. And so we're thankful for each and every blessing that we have. We ask that you watch over us and bless us. That as we continue to live for you in the future, that we will have the, the wisdom to live the life that you would have us to live. That we'll be the shining example before others. That we'll truly let our light shine so that they'll see you and glorify you. We ask now that you watch over us and bless us. And that you hold us within your hand as we hold to you. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. May God bless each of you and God keep you. The Lord's invitation is open. If you need to become a New Testament child of God or you need to, to be restored to your first love, maybe you've walked away, whatever the case may be, you need to come. I want you to do so while together we stand and sing.